to raise your hand if you or someone you know has faced a mental health illness. Now, I'd like you to look around. Keep your hands raised. Look around. This right here is incredibly powerful. I'm not sure if many of you realize this right now, but you're actually breaking the status quo. This room was a testament to the idea that mental health is something that all of us share. This is about all of us. It's about the boyfriend who's faced bipolar disorder his entire life, the brother who contemplated suicide, and the girl who thought, even if just for a moment, things would just not get better. So why did I raise my hands earlier? A few years ago, one Thursday night at 3.30 in the morning, I was finishing up the last problem on my organic chemistry homework assignment. I was tired and I checked my email and I saw that I had an unread message from a friend I'll call Casey. Half expecting it to be a funny YouTube clip or a note from her, I opened it and was surprised and shocked by what I saw. In the email, Casey talked about how she had recently gone through a breakup with her boyfriend and how she had gotten herself into such a desperate situation that she no longer felt the reason to live. A few lines jumped out at me from her email to me. The first was that I will be doing minimum to survive. And the second was I asked him for one day in which I could devote every part of my soul to him, to repay him for all the things that he's done to me and to say a proper goodbye. Her note ended in a chilling manner. She said, if I can't have my wish granted, I will no longer have reason to live. Please understand me. Anyways, I'm sure you'll be perfectly fine without me. And as I read her message, a number of emotions went through my mind. Panic, anger, sadness, and frustration. Panic, because I didn't really know who you could talk to at 3.30 in the morning to help a friend in need. Anger, because I couldn't believe that she thought that our friendship was so meaningless to me, that whether she was alive or dead, it didn't matter. Sadness, because I felt like she had gotten herself into such a situation and I didn't really know how to get her out of it. And frustration, because as you can tell, I really wanted to help her out, but didn't really know what to do. What was more surprising about this incident to me was that she and I had been working together with MIT Medical to help students who are in a situation similar to hers. What was fortunate about that experience was that I was able to meet like-minded students and MIT medical professionals who could help me figure out what to do to help her. So the following morning, a friend of mine and I sat down together with some clinicians to figure out a plan to help bring her out of the brink and keep her safe. As part of that plan, we had her hospitalized for a few days so she could regroup and think about what was going on in her life before she had to face her academic commitments. And when she came back, she told us that she was feeling better and that things were great, but we figured that this had something to do with her boyfriend, who we believed was emotionally abusive and manipulative. When she was at the hospital, he had called her and told her that he wanted to get back together with her once he had found out that she wanted to commit suicide. Over the course of the following year, this boyfriend continued to tell her that we were feeding her bad information by telling her to be independent and self-sufficient. And ultimately, at the end of that year, he gave her a choice to make. It was either him or it was us. And ultimately, she chose him. After that point, I never really heard from her, and I was afraid to reach out to her because I wanted to make sure that she was safe and that I would be safe. I have never felt as helpless or as frustrated as a friend as I did in that point in time. And after that, I became more actively engaged in mental health policy efforts at MIT. As president of MIT's chapter of Active Minds, a national nonprofit of 400 chapters that works to destigmatizing mental health issues on undergraduate campuses, I soon found out how daunting the task of solving mental health challenges not only at MIT, but across the country really is. One in four people lives with a mental health illness, but out of fear and shame, a lot of them don't get the help that they need. Suicide is the second leading cause of death amongst college students, leading to 1,100 deaths per year. And 20% of American students live with a mental health disorder on a day-to-day -day basis. That's 3.6 million students who deal with these issues. And 18 through 24 is the average on age of onset for most mental health disorders. Each of these statistics speaks to the need to really revitalize our mental health policy on campuses. At MIT, there were three challenges. The first was that there was a stigma surrounding seeking help or even having mental illness. It was perceived as a sign of weakness. Second, 
there is a feeling that adequate help was just unavailable. And third, there was a system of scattered resources. What we soon found out was that over time, these resources had been uncoordinated and had seen a lack of use, and that instead students were actually talking to each other more. This corroborated a study that found that 67% of students actually reach out to their friends when having suicidal thoughts. It was based off of the idea that we weren't engaging the people who were best suited for helping their fellow peers, that I created Peer Ears, a peer referral service that was created with students and faculty to empower students to help each other out. At the heart of the Peer Ears approach was proactive support. The Peer Ears model differed from what existed at MIT in three key ways. The first was that peer ears were selected by their dorm mates, and so there was a level of accountability and approachability that was created between students and their fellow peer ears. Second, peer ears were created to unify the services that were available and streamline the process between when a student had a challenge and when they received help and sustaining that help and support. And third, peer ears worked with the existing arms of the support system to ensure that all of them were communicating with, the, with each other to provide the best support. The impact has been significant since the introduction of peer ears. We can see this in the introduction of new initiatives, including the RU OK Mental Health Hackathon, peer-to-peer -peer and online counseling effort, number of de-stressing activities conducted by the UA, and MIT Together, an online portal created by students and administrators. Additionally, students and administrators are collaborating together more than they ever had with respect to mental health issues and are working together to solve them on campus. And while we're still gathering usage data, for a lot of these services, we know that the conversation has really changed at MIT. There are more articles about mental health illness, there are more blog posts, and there are more conversations that are really based on students working with each other to empower one another and be successful at the school. This transformation isn't just unique to MIT. We're seeing this all across the country. At UMD, Samantha Roman, the president of Active Minds chapter in 2012, created a policy change that allowed students to take leaves of absences for mental health reasons without getting a failing grade in their classes. At GWU, students lobbied with their administrative officials to ensure that fees were cut for mental health care visits. At UCLA, across the country, students created a student wellness commission where they could share ideas and support one another. And at Oregon State University, students created a Be Well blog where they work together and share tips about how to support and be safe in campus. And across the road at Harvard University, group counseling services are offered to help students work with one another as they face similar mental health obstacles at Harvard. But these conversations aren't just isolated to individual universities. In fact, in Boston, BU, Tufts, MIT and Harvard are all working together to create a stronger mental health intercollegiate conversation. These changes are incredibly exciting, and yet this is only the beginning. A number of universities still have yet to create a well-defined support model for their students, and still others create punishments for their students and make it hard for students to take leaves of absences for their mental health is issues. And others still believe in the traditional counseling method and haven't figured out ways to engage students to help each other. A study in 2011 by the National Alliance for Mental Illness found that 62% of students who withdrew from institutions had actually gone through traditional counseling sessions. The same study found that more students are withdrawing from institutions, and yet those same students are actually visiting mental health care centers in record numbers. And I think most disturbing of all, 40% of American students feel that they are not supported. That's 7.2 million students who feel that they don't have a voice, and even if they did, no one would listen. I urge you to think about the Sandy Hook shootings, the Virginia Tech shootings, Aaron Schwartz, and Tyler Clemente suicides. Each of these events affirms the idea that mental health illness not only affects specific individuals, but those around them. It's also important to note that mental health illness isn't correlated with violence. In fact, millions of people suffer from mental health disorders on a day-to-day -day basis, and they do so silently. Rather than waiting for tragedies to become a call to action, I urge all of us to keep the conversation alive, to realize how many lives are really at stake, and to engage policymakers to really make some changes to ensure that these events don't happen again. But policy prescriptions aside, more importantly, solving mental health challenges can start close to home. They might be the people that you see in the media, 
There are the Demi Lovatos, the Mel Gibsons, the, the Elton Johns of the world. But they're also the Susan Rose Blowners, the Scott Simmies, and they're the Ellen Sachs, the people that you will never meet but still face these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Each of these examples shows us that it's important for us to work together, to support each other, and to listen to each other, and ultimately be our own agents of change. To do this, we don't just need a transformation, we actually need a revolution. And for that reason, I would like you to repeat after me. I'm here to listen. I'm here to listen. I'm here to share. And I'm here to change and fight stigma. You and I, we've entered into a movement and to a, into a pact with each other that we're going to destigmatize mental health together. We're going to listen to each other, we're going to support each other, and ultimately fight stigma hand in hand every day. I'd like you to share this pact with those, those around you when you go home today. Tell your spouse, a loved one, a friend, even someone that you don't know, that you're there to listen, because you just might be saving a life. Thank you.